When you think about investing in real estate, what comes to mind? Apartments, single family homes, self storage. But what about a hotel investment? That's right, hotels. Well, in 2020, the pandemic caused a major disruption within the travel industry as hotels saw their occupancy rates drop to single digits. But up until that point, me personally, I'd only invested in multifamily properties and had really never considered investing in a hotel. But during the pandemic, many hotel owners had to actually sell off their property, which actually opened up opportunities within this particular asset class, which I decided to capitalize on and remember what the great Albert Einstein once said, in the midst of every crisis lies a great opportunity. Now, if you're new here, I'm Dr. Jeff Anzalone, a periodontist that's on a mission to get you out of the rat race with passive income creation. You can download the free passive income guide below this video. Now, back in 2021, I decided to, again, capitalize on this new asset class as hotels began hitting the market with extremely steep discounts. And in this video, we're going to discuss the five things you should know if you're considering investing in a hotel. So without further ado, let's get going. Number one has to do with variable pricing. Now, one of the main differences between hotels and other commercial real estate is based on the way that it's priced or its pricing structure. Now, regarding hotel operations, the owners typically rent out a hotel room on a nightly basis. But on the other hand, people that have offices, multifamily, um, other things like that, they typically get their tenants to sign leases you know, for multifamily, it could be anywhere from a year to office or retail up to 10 years. Now with hotel property, you may see an increase in the cost to book a room like during a holiday, you know, especially a holiday weekend or if, if a large local event is happening. If there's like a concert coming into town, a big sporting event, Super Bowl, NBA championship, something like that. Whereas the room would typically cost less off season or even midweek. Now, the hotel's ability to instantly respond to changes in the local market is a huge plus. And hotels are able to actually adjust their day rates to quickly capture benefits of a really tight market or lower the risk of a day or month with lower occupancy. Now, this flexibility allows hotel investments the opportunity to benefit from capital improvements and operational enhancements much faster than what we see in some of the other sectors. But as quickly as hotel operators can increase the rates, they may find the need to actually lower them when they're experiencing some market disruptions, such as if there's any increased competition in the area, if the local economy starts to weaken or during a pandemic. All right, number two, let's talk about the five different, it's important to know about the five different categories that hotels are in. And these are typically defined by the, the services and the amenities they offer. Let's start off with the full service. So when you see full service, you think Ritz-Carlton, Montage, Four Seasons, St. Regis, you know, those types of really upscale luxury hotels. And they're typically providing their guests with a variety of services and amenities, such as really nice spas, fitness centers, meeting rooms, banquet space, typically on-site retail and restaurants. These hotels, they really heavily depend on their competitive positioning of their amenities and their service, and they also typically rely on typically a big staff. Next is going to be the limited service option. And when you think of limited uh, service options, you're thinking of uh, Comfort Inn, Hampton Inn, Holiday Inn Express, those types of hotels. And most of these typically don't have a restaurant, but they do still provide certain services and amenities such as pool, fitness center, and limited meeting space. And you can expect to encounter in these types of hotels a smaller number of staff just because they don't have to have them to run different things like you would see in the full service. Next would be the select service. And hotels within this category were cr basically created to bridge the gap between was well, actually a widening gap between the full service and the limited service hotel offerings. Now they adhere to the same core principles that the limited service category, though they have typically a subset of the services and amenities characteristic of the full service property, such as 
uh, banquet facilities and a scale, by, scale back restaurant offering. And some of the examples in this category are the Hilton Garden Inn and the Courtyard by Marriott Hotels. Next, we have the extended stay. And these hotels were designed for, that's right, guests that are needing something, longer term guests needing uh, temporary housing or your typical business traveler. And most of these offer larger rooms, typically they're, they're suites with access to kitchen and laundry facilities with discounted rates because they're staying longer. They could be staying a week, two weeks, month, even, even longer. And the brands that are, that are typically within this category are going to be the Homewood Suites and the Embassy Suites. Next, we have the budget. And the budget hotels are just what they sound like, lower cost lodging for people on a tight budget. And they, as you can imagine, they offer very few services and amenities. Popular brands are good old Super 8 and the Days Inn. Third, let's get into some of the key metrics that, that are really important to understand when you're looking at these deals. So before you consider to invest in the hospitality space, it's really important to look at these three KPIs, the occupancy, the ADR or average daily rate, and the RevPAR or the revenue per available room. So let's start off with the uh, ADR, the average daily rate. Now, uh, this is uh, also, they'll, they'll, uh, people talking about it always, you know, say ADR, ADR, and I was always wondering, you know, what are they talking about? It's average daily rate. And it's calculated, you, you divide the, the total room revenue for all the rooms by the number of rooms that are actually sold, okay? So the total, the total room revenue divided by the rooms actually sold. And that's how you get th that calculation. And this is especially helpful when, whenever hotels are actually assessing their different pricing levels. Next, we have the occupancy rate, which is pretty self-explanatory. This is basically nothing more than the, the number of rooms sold divided by the total number of rooms available. And this measures the, the utilization of a property's available occupancy. And last but not least is the RevPAR. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, the revenue per available room. It's a metric that basically provides information regarding rooms being sold and how much revenue is being generated from these bookings. And this really helps operators measure the revenue generating performance to accurately price the rooms. Now to calculate the RevPAR, you're going to multiply the ADR, the average daily rate, by the occupancy rate. And in this example, we've got somebody with, that has a hotel with 80% occupancy rate. And if you multiply it by the ADR, then you're going to get an 80%, $80 RevPAR. And RevPAR actually complements the ADR, the average daily rate, because while the ADR only considers the average rate of rooms sold, RevPAR takes into consideration the number of rooms that were actually occupied at that rate over a given period. Now, this can provide a very powerful metric for analyzing the performance and the competitiveness of any hotel over any given period. Now, in the hotel world, the operators focus a lot on the performance of their competitive set. And this is due to the fact that hotel guests, whenever they're, you know, if, you know, most of the time they go online and they're looking on their phones or looking on their computers to make their lodging decisions. And they usually make their lodging decisions in real time because they're scrolling through, they're looking and have, you know, the competitive set is the, the factors that come into play, such as, as they're scrolling through, they're looking what type of services. This is three star, four star, two star, five star, what type of amenities? What about the cleanliness? What about the location? Okay, so usually their decisions are relative to certain uh, moving de demand drivers, such as if there's an event that they're going to, or you know, if uh, there's different offices that they're wanting to visit. If they work at a particular office and they're, they're working out of state, they wanna be close to that office or restaurants, that sort of thing. All right, fourth would be the success drivers to hotel real estate success. And before I personally invested in the hotel space, I thought the majority of hotel demand was based on the tourism sector. 
Well, that's one part of it. Well, the other part uh, heavily relies on the good old business traveler. Now, while tourists typically uh, increase, you know, during the weekend and holiday season, they, they increase that demand. It's really the business travel that boosts the demand from Sunday through Thursday. And then something else to consider is actually the local market that the hotel is in because there are going to be local attractions such as popular venues, universities, water parks, things like that, that can offer unique demand drivers to their respective markets. Our family loves to snow ski and we've, we've got a place we love going to out in, in uh, Colorado, Bachelors Gulch, Colorado. We go there every year and they, as you can imagine, ski resorts, they experience their peak occupancies during the winter while hotels, you know, for instance, hotels near, near convention centers, things like that, they can expect high demand during certain events at the convention center. So again, it depends on the local market. And another way to help drive top line revenues is to ensure a really important, have a quality operating team that's in place. And as the hotel management team plays a major role in operations. So let me erase this and we will make a little room for our fifth and final one. Now, one of the first steps to take before investing really in any type of real estate is to figure out, do you want to become an active or a passive investor? And by doing this, uh, that'll help guide you on the right path. This is what my wife and I did many, many years ago. We said, you know what? I'm a periodontist. I'm running a full-time practice. I want to be a good father to my kids. I want to stay married. So I decided to go the passive route because my time was worth more than anything. Now, as I get older and the kids move out, that will probably move more towards active investing. But as of back then, and as of now, I chose the passive route. And then once you make that decision, whether active or passive, then you can choose between one of these three things that we're going to talk about. The first one are hotel REITs and REITs are real estate Inve investment trust. And this is a very easy method for somebody that's real busy. They can passively invest in real estate. Now, whenever you invest in these, you're actually purchasing a stock in a company that invests in commercial real estate. And these can either be public or private. And typically REITs specialize in one particular property sec sector, such as there's lodging REITs and there's like resort REITs. And Another advantage of investing in REITs is that you can buy or sell your shares at any time. Thus, your money is very liquid. Second way that you can invest is direct purchase. Now, as you can imagine, purchasing a hotel outright yourself would require hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of capital and then you've got to find a source that's going to be willing to finance the debt. Most professionals, just single professionals, uh, would have a hard time with the direct purchase as being an active investor. If you're an active investor, plus you're a professional, again, it's, just, it's going to take up a lot of time. So if you're wanting to do all this, and then you got to figure out managing it, doing the daily operations, marketing it. Same thing if you were to buy a big apartment complex yourself. So again, the direct purchase, that would be more for somebody that this that they do that full time. It's not the best thing to do if you have a nine to five job. I'm not saying it can't be done, but that would be more for the active investor. The REIT's more for the passive investor. And my favorite, which again would be for uh, the passive investor, would be the syndication. As you've probably uh watch several other videos. This is actually my favorite real estate investing uh, way to invest in real estate because this appeals mostly to the busy professional that again wants to focus their time on doing what they do best yet invest in real estate. So if you're a dentist, you do what you do best. You spend a lot of time, you spend a lot of money, you probably maybe have some student loan debt, but that's your biggest income driver. And the better you get, the more money you can make, the more money you can make, the more money you can invest in assets at cash flow. Now, hotel syndications, they're set up similar to the apartment syndications that, that I've invested in in the past. You've got the sponsor or the general partner, and then you've got the passive investor or the limited partner, which would be you. So these people 
they're the ones that are going to find the hotels. They're going to source the deals. They're going to do everything. They're going to run it. They're going to be, they're going to do everything. Whereas the limited partners, which would be you and me, we're the passive investors. Okay. The limited partners really don't have much of a job. It just basically sit back, collect our either quarterly or monthly distribution checks during a whole period. And that could be anywhere from four years to seven years or longer. And as with most syndications, these deals are for credit investors only. And typically the initial investments range anywhere from the $50,000 on the low end to seventy-five dollars to $100,000 or more on the high end. So there you have it. The five reasons to consider investing in real estate in, in hotels. Now, in case you missed it, I've put together a, actually a two-part series where I give you my ultimate strategy guide to investing in hotels. If you want to grab it, you can check it out over here and I'll see you in this video where we check out my ultimate strategy guide for hotels. Take care.